So hello, my name is Bill Daniels and I'm the program leader for Native Seed Communities, which is a project of the Indiana Native Plant Society. I'm very excited that horticulturist Do Dolly Foster is joining us this evening to talk to us about starting seeds outdoors and in closed containers. First off, for those of you that aren't aware of Indiana Native Seed Communities, we're a project uh, of the Indiana Native Plant Society and we promote networks of native plant enthusiasts working regionally to, uh, to uh, propagate, process and prepare native plant seeds native to Indiana. And, uh, and in doing this, we want to increase the presence of these ecologically appropriate plants. Uh, for those that may not be uh, aware of this, we have a lot of materials on our Indiana Native Plant Society's website on growing native plants from seed. We also have a growing number of us that share information on Facebook. I'll share with you both of those links in the chat in case you've not been to the sites yet. All right, well, let's get right to our speaker. Dolly Foster, landscape horticulturist, yeah, okay. has, Thanks. has been a master gardener for 22 years an Indiana accredited horticulturist for 20 and a certified arborist for 2000, uh, since 2008. For the past 22 years, Dolly has been presenting lectures on many gardening topics. She spent a few years as adjunct faculty of the Juliet Junior College Agriculture and Horticulture Department and 18 years in the parks and recreation industry as staff horticulturist for two park districts. She has been butterfly gardening from the very beginning of her gardening career. Her passion has led her to raising monarch and swallowtail butterflies for 15 years. Her garden at home has been a monarch way station since 2011. Dolly also managed the Oak Lawn Community Garden, pan garden and Pantry for six years. All right, I'm very happy to present to you Dolly Foster. Thank you for having me, everybody. I am really happy to be here. Talk about winter sowing again. Um, it's one of my things that I love most about gardening and mostly because it is super easy. Um, takes all the riskiness out of starting seeds when starting seeds indoors is risky. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, a little bit more about myself. I've been um, growing native plants for a number of years, and I started out being interested in natives when I found out about there being a Wild Ones chapter opening here in Hammond, Indiana, where I live. And up until this year, 2022, um, our Gibson Woods Wild Ones chapter was the only one in the whole state of Indiana. So it's comforting to know that there are other people in the state who are really interested in natives and care about natives because we've sort of been insular up here in Northwest Indiana thinking that we were the only ones <laughs> because we don't really interact with the Indiana Native uh, Plant Society. But I think that maybe we should try and do that a little bit more. Um, but I've been a member for, for that Wild Ones chapter for 22 years, um, like I said, since they began. I have learned a lot from that, pro from that group, and I've also done a lot of programs for that group. And it's a, a group that is very close to my heart. A very good group of people, and we've done a lot of really good education up here in Northwest Indiana. So let's get started. These should be some very familiar seeds to all of you native plant lovers. I'm sure you all recognize the milkweed seed right there in the center. Um, but the other ones are all familiar to me as they should be to you. So I hope they are. So let's talk a little bit about what winter sowing is. This is a really, um, a really fantastic method of starting seeds. And ironically, you're gonna start your seeds outdoors in the winter. And I really do not remember how I got started with winter sowing. I really cannot remember. I don't know if I went to a program. Did I see a video online? I really can't remember. But um, I started, I think in 2014 and failed miserably. One thing that you will learn about me is that I am not afraid of telling you my mistakes and my fumbles. 
because I learn from them. And I think that my students always learn from the things that I screwed up on and figured out how to fix. It's the best way of uh, learning something. Don't ever ask me how many plants I've killed in my 22 years as a horticulturist. Because it will probably make you pass out. Um, so winter sewing. Uh, I failed miserably the first year. I took the second year off. And then I started winter sewing um, probably around, I guess it was around 2016, 2017. And I've been doing it every year. And when I make my jugs, I usually make between 80 and 150. So it just depends on my needs for the year. In my job at the park district that I worked at, I was winter sowing plants for our um, flower beds there and to give away. Um, now I am starting seeds for um, my own plant sale here at my home. So last year I started 135 jugs and I had about 99 germinate. And then after I opened up my jugs in the spring, I had a few more germinate. So it's a very good, um, very good year last year. So this is placing your seeds outdoors. The containers are a protected, invented, uh, encapsulated little greenhouse. Um, we don't really like to call it a greenhouse so much but it really does act as a greenhouse. This fosters a naturally timed germination. That is the whole point of this. The woman who started this method is named Trudy Davidoff. And Trudy lives on Long Island in New York. She runs the Winter Sowers Facebook page where I'm a, a member and a group expert. And if at any time you have questions about winter sowing and you want to know more, the Winter Sowers Facebook page is an excellent resource. So I encourage you to go and um, check it out, uh, join, and uh, join the other 85,000 people who have joined from across the, across the world. The first, uh, the first uh, lecture I did, we had people from like Scotland and Australia and things like that. It was really interesting. So uh, from all over the place. So the, uh, what I think is one of the best things about winter sowing is the high rate of germination that I get. Previously, I was starting my native plants in my greenhouse at work. I had a nice little greenhouse, but it was a greenhouse that I had to heat for, for annuals, for tropical plants. I was overwintering bananas and elephant ears and all kinds of really big, beautiful things that I was putting into my planters at the park district. And um, it was not suitable for native plants. They would germinate beautifully. They would grow for a couple of weeks. It would be too wet, too warm, too humid, and they would die. It was extremely rare that I had a plant that I had sown in the greenhouse that was a native actually make it to the point that I could plant it in the ground. It, it was not happening very often. So I needed to find some other method to do this because I needed native plants for my plantings at the park district. So high rate of germination is one of the best things about this. It's really great for all different kinds of plants, including vegetables. And it's recognized by the USDA as a good sound gardening practice. It's in their dictionary of gardening practices. And many university extensions all over the country are educating on this, including the one where I am a master gardener and I'm doing the educating for it. So I'm really proud of that, that they asked me to do that. So in essence, this is, this is what it is. It looks like there's a bunch of trash on my back deck every year. But my neighbors know that I'm kind of a crazy plant lady and um, they're, <laughs> they're pretty forgiving with all the stuff that I do. Um, this is just like just a start. This was last year and this was just a start of what I ended up with. So why are we going to sow our seeds inside? Well, it's because sowing seeds in a house is tricky. If you've ever tried to do it, it, it really is a drag. Uh, the first year I tried to do it, I tried it in my basement because it was the only place I had to do it. I live in a very small house. It's a Cape Cod and um, not very many windows. It's kind of dark. During the winter, it's drafty and it's dry. So uh, not a great place for seeds. The basement was damp and cold. So not a great place for seeds. I had very few that survived. 
And um, direct sowing out in the garden can be really disappointing. Um, a lot of people like to go out there and throw seeds on the ground and say, oh, I, I direct sowed all this stuff and it's going to be great when it comes up. It'll be great when it comes up if you can discern your native seedlings from your weed seedlings. So that's a big problem with direct sowing. And I'm not going to knock direct sowing because for those of us who are conservationists and we are going to go out into nature and into um, into different places around the area to you know, oversee the prairie, oversee the restoration, start a new garden in a, in a big area, we have to be able to winter sow or direct sow. So winter sowing is a great solution if you need plugs, if you need plant plugs for any kind of application. Mm -hmm. The idea is similar, again, to making a mini greenhouse. And one of the other cool things about this is that you're going to reuse lots of containers that you would normally just get into the recycling bin right away. So they get to be reused again at least one more time, sometimes twice, before they get re, uh, recycled. So that's kind of nice. It's important to note that winter sowing does not mean that you are going to get earlier flowers and earlier vegetables and fruit. It does not mean that. It means that these plants are going to germinate at the appropriate time for that plant. This plant will be ready and stronger when you go to plant it in the ground at the appropriate time that that plant should be planted. You know, think about tomatoes. We plant tomatoes around Mother's Day. It does not mean that we're gonna get earlier fruit. It does not mean that we're gonna have tomatoes, for example, uh, sprouting in January and we're gonna have fruit by Easter. That, that is an impractical thought. What you need to think about is that this method is going to give you strong seedlings with good root systems that will be able to be put directly into the ground without any kind of waiting period and bumping up and anything like that. You don't necessarily have to do that with this method. Some other advantages is um, all kinds of advantages actually. You don't have to buy lights and shelves. You don't have to buy pots and trays. There's no damping off, which is really disappointing when damping off is a fungal disease and it's really disappointing when you walk into your seed room and everything is just laying on the ground uh, in, your, in your trays. They're all dead. There's no coming back from damping off disease. There's less frequent watering. I am not going to say that there is no watering with winter sowing because that was my mistake in the first winter. It was the reason why I was not successful was because I thought and the directions that I got said, put your containers outside and you don't need to touch them until spring. Untrue. And if you do go and explore the blog world out there and are reading posts from other people, if anyone is telling you that you don't have to ever water your containers during the winter, it is not correct. That's all I'm going to say about that. And I will talk about watering a little bit later. There's no hardening off with this method, which is probably one of the greatest things. Your seedlings are going to be weed free as long as the seeds that you put into the containers is weed free. Cold stratification is automatic, germination is high, and you transplant faster. So I think those are all really big advantages of this method. So very quickly, I know that we are mostly going to um, be referring to this method in respect to native plants tonight, but what I want to do is just define what a hardy annual is, half hardy tropical annual. And uh, because I am a specialist in pollinator gardening and I do believe in planting a few annuals in pots around my property along with my uh, native plants hand in hand. And that is a great way to enhance my pollinator garden. So some of you may disagree with that and I respect that, that's fine. But for those of you who also plant other things, this is going to be the definitions of these plants that you need. So a hardy annual is a relatively cold tolerant um, plant. So it means that um, it's an annual that's going to germinate a little bit faster in the jugs and you will be able to put it out towards the end of April and uh, depending on where you're at. And that means that these annuals immediately can take some cold temperatures overnight. Not necessarily freezing temperatures, but they can take some cold temperatures. So sweet peas is a good example of this, although I have never been successful getting sweet peas to bloom. So 
they're off my list forever after this spring. Half hardy annuals are annuals that can be directly sown in the garden after the last frost. For example, that would be zinnias. So what that means is that I would probably sow those at the end of March or into the beginning of April. For me in this area near Chicago, for the past three Aprils, we have had a three to five day period in the middle of April, the third week of April, where we have had 20 degree temperatures overnight. I have to wait and plant my zinnias in my jugs until after that happens. Otherwise, if I have seedlings, they usually get bit by the frost and they die. Tender annual is an annual seed that's gonna tolerate absolutely no extended period of cold. And the, a good example of this is impatience, which isn't a pollinator plant for anything as far as I know. So, but there's a lot of other tender annuals that are pretty cool to grow if you're, if you're interested in that. So you can spring sow these seeds and I'll explain that at the end. So all of these can be spring, uh, winter sown in uh, temperate four season climate. So if you are in the warmest part of zone eight and above, zone nine, zone 10, winter sowing might not be for you. Um, you might have limited success uh, or you might have a lot of success with tender annuals. So you just gotta play around with it. So when do you start? Well, theoretically, if you wanted to winter sow this winter, you've already been gathering up things like jugs and, and other containers, and you have been gathering uh, potting soil. Potting soil is gonna be the hardest thing for you to find during the winter. And um, one thing I really encourage you to do, and if you're taking notes, write this one down. If you can't find potting soil at a local garden center or a big box store, then make sure you check out local horticultural supply companies. These are the companies that actually supply the greenhouses in your area. They will have potting soil all year round because greenhouses are planting new plants in January and February and March before the potting soil is available in the garden centers. So these are horticultural supply companies. In the Chicagoland area, we have Carlin. They're one of my suppliers that I used at the uh, park district for many, many years. In fact, all 15 years that I worked there. And uh, they are open to the public, so I can walk in there and I can say, I need 12 bags of potting soil, and they have it for me. So it's a good company to work with. Uh, if you find horticultural supply companies in your area, call ahead, make sure they are open to the public. There is one here in the Chicagoland area that is not open to the public. So I, now I would not be able to go into it. So um, other supplies that you're going to go and, and need, we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, but some of the other things that you need to know about getting started is that this is an extremely flexible method of planting. You can start at the winter solstice, and the point of starting around the winter solstice is the overnight temperatures. That is your cue. When the overnight temperatures are... Um, consistently below 40 degrees for multiple weeks, and you know that that really consistent cold temperature is going to continue through, say, March, uh, then you can start winter sowing. So this is going to vary by region, so you have to kind of start paying attention to your overnight temperatures and when you get you know when are you freezing in your area, how long do those freeze last? You know, um, one of the cues for stopping to make containers is when you start putting your house plants outside, which is when our overnight temperatures are in the mid 50s. So the, you can take your cues with those overnight temperatures. It's been very useful for me to use that as a cue. Um, and you by no means have to start all of your containers all at once. Okay, so when to plant. So there is a lot of different uh, views of thought on when to plant and uh, how to do this and get started. And uh, there is one faction, I might say. There's one group that really enjoys just making all their drugs at one time, which is great. It's fine. I would do it if I had time, but I don't have time. So this is kind of the suggested schedule of when I plant the things that I grow and it's worked out for me. So it might work out for you. But again, I urge you, this is a suggested schedule. You can plant any of these plants in between January to February. 
It doesn't matter if it's the first week of January or the last week of February. It doesn't matter. It's extremely flexible. Do not get pigeonholed into thinking that these are also the only months that you can plant these things because you can plant them all at the beginning or at the end of December, at the beginning of the winter season, after the solstice. You can plant some of these after the 1st of March. You still have enough time for overnight cold temperatures until April. You can do that. Again, pay attention to your cold, your overnight cold temperatures to tell you when to do it. Um, just don't feel like you have to do it all at one time and don't feel like this is a rigid schedule because it is not, okay? It, it seems to be the one thing that is uh, hard to, for the first timers to really get to do, to learn how to do. So what I do between January and February is I'm going to start perennials. So these are my non-native perennials and I do grow a few. And then all of my natives, I grow about 60 different varieties of natives. And some of these are Asclepias and Coreopsis, Echinaceas, Eutrochium, which is the new name for um, Joe Pieweed for the Eupatoriums. Uh, Helenium, I grow Loiatris, I grow Lobelias, uh, Rudbeckias, Ruella, Sophiam, so, uh, Solidago, and Verbenas. I grow a lot of different varieties, and these are all seeds that I collect myself. There's very few of them that I have to buy anymore. And um, from what I understand about your group, you guys are collecting your own seed too, which is really cool. I love collecting seed. It is my second love after a wild, after a winter sowing, and I do. Um, I do have a lecture about collecting seeds. So winter hardy annuals can also be done during this time. This is going to be black eyed Susan. So like uh, Rudbeckia triloba is somewhere in there between biennial and hardy annual. So for me, it's a perennial my, in my microclimate of my patio. So it's a little different for everybody. But other things that are not native that are annuals that are pollinator plants I will grow. Malvas and poppies and uh, pansies and Spanish flag vine is one of my favorite ones for the hummingbirds. I love snapdragons for the hummingbirds and the bumblebees. Um, sweet pea you can do at this time, verbena. And by verbena, I mean verbena bonariensis, which uh, is not a native, but it's a really, really good pollinator uh, plant. So, and I grow that along with my two varieties of native verbena. I have hoary vervain and blue vervain. Vegetables, I'm not going to go into vegetables. You can see the list there. Um, I will say one thing about perennial herbs, though, thyme, oregano, sage, and parsley. If you are going to start perennial herbs in milk jugs or any other type of container, really be mindful of how many plants you need. If you only have room for six thyme plants, because thyme, thyme grows four feet wide, then, you know, plant accordingly. If you buy a package of thyme seeds, there's going to probably be one to 200 seeds in that container or in that package. Don't plant all of them because you will have a uh, big hairy mess in your container and you're gonna have so many plants you're not gonna know what to do with. One of the goals of winter sowing is to seed your plants, uh, seed your containers so that you don't have to thin them. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. All right, uh, by March, it's time to put in half hardy tender and tender annuals, more veggies. In April, if you're, if you're going with vegetables, you do the really tender stuff like tomato and basil at the end of April. All right, things that you're going to need. I prefer milk jugs and water jugs and um, the jugs that windshield wiper fluid comes in. I prefer this because these, these containers have that tapered top. The tapered top acts as a flue for the hot air that is going to have to escape your container. So this is why I prefer these. This is by no means the only types of containers that you can use for winter sewing. I'm gonna show you some examples of that in a minute. You're going to need a box knife. You're gonna need utility scissors. Think about things that you already have around the house. One of the other goals of winter sewing, besides not thinning, is to use things around the house. Don't go out and buy specialized equipment. Try and be adaptable with what you have. Um, the black and white scissors in my picture here, those are kitchen scissors. So if you have a pair of kitchen scissors or a spare pair, you can use this for this plastic. This type of plastic is really easy to cut through, but a box cutter is really helpful to get your hole started, to get your line started. 
you're going to need potting soil. Um, you're going to need some kind of tape. And um, ACE makes a really good tape called poly tape. And then um, you can use any kind of duct tape that you want. So there's duct tapes out there that are pretty inexpensive and there's some that are really expensive. Doesn't matter. It all sticks. It's all pretty weatherproof. You're going to need plant markers. And by that, I mean uh, the tags, white tags. And if you don't wanna spend money on white tags and somebody had a graduation last summer and you have 400 plastic knives in a box somewhere from a party, use the plastic knives. I have, it's great, it's cheap. Uh, you're gonna need a large rubber band and a ruler for at least the first time that you do this. So you may have to buy a large rubber band. You may not have to. If you can draw a straight line without a guide, you don't need a big rubber band. You are going to need a UV resistant marker. And I know this is gonna be really hard to see and I'm gonna show you this up close in a minute. This is something called the garden marker. And this is the only reliable UV resistant garden marker that I have ever encountered. And I used it the whole time that I worked in the park district in my greenhouse. And um, when you write the name of the plant on your jug or and on your tags, if you go over it twice, then they will be very reliable. And of course, you're going to need your seeds. So these are all things that you want to try and gather up before you get started. Um, make sure you have everything in one place. There's a couple of other things in this picture that um, I will explain as we go through the directions. Finn says, don't forget to put tags inside your jugs. At the end of the winter time, when you go to open your jugs, the seedlings are pretty much all going to look the same. And if you don't have tags in there, especially if you have things like both lobelia, cardinal and blue lobelia, if you have both native verbenas, if you have multiple echinaceas, if you have multiple asclepias, if you have multiple milkweeds, oh, you're sunk because they all, when they're very small, they all look alike. So make sure that tagging the insides of your containers is one of your big priorities. Okay. Um, this is one of the containers that I do use. Uh, I have cats but I don't use litter that comes in these big jugs, but I have a friend who does and she saves her jugs for me. And uh, this is a great way to start a lot of seeds. This is usually how I start my butterfly seed, my swamp milkweed seed and my common milkweed seed because I can start like 200 seeds in there. They're very large. These containers are very large. They're also very hard to cut through. So if cutting through something that's really a terrible, awkward shape is going to be hard for you. This might not be a good choice for you. But if you're in need of a lot of plants and you have it handy and you're able to cut through it, because it is difficult to cut through that thick plastic, then you can use it. So there's lots of other choices though. Um, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor? Oh, cool. Um, this is an ice cream container for one gallon ice cream. This is a great container. These little containers that fruit come in are really good for just a few seeds. Whatever container you choose, it has to be able to hold a minimum of four inches of soil. That's really important, especially for natives. In fact, that's another reason why I like to use the milk jugs and water jugs, because I know I can get about just almost exactly four inches of soil in the containers. And it really does make a great, big, nice, long root system. These little containers down here on the bottom are little, I think they're like half pint soup containers. Now these will work, but these will work best for something that is going to be transplanted very, very quickly in spring, something like lettuce. So um, if you're not doing vegetables, then this is not, this is not the thing to put cut plant seedlings in. Do not put something like cut plant seeds or something else that's going to be completely enormous. That is not the container for you. If a, if a leaf hits the inside of a container where there is water condensating and it sits there for too long, the leaf will rot. So this is why I say you need a lot of headroom for big natives. Other choices, you can use two gallon and one gallon uh, plastic bags. I tried it last year just to try it and it worked out well. The only thing I would say is to turn you away from using the plastic bags is that they're not recyclable. It's really, if, if there is a place to recycle them, I have never found it. 
And um, so I did just try it as an experiment because people always talk about it. If you're in a situation in your job or something where getting Ziploc bags all the time is something that is available to you for free, um, then I would say you can probably use them. If those Ziploc bags are just going to sit in a drawer somewhere, go ahead and use them. Let's see. Another thing that you can reuse, uh, one of the members of the Facebook page was extremely clever using this. This is a package that a comforter comes in. And every time I buy a comforter or a set of sheets or something like that, I always say to myself, I should hang on to this container because someday it's going to be important. I am gonna someday be able to reuse this container for something, either for storing something or something like this. This is genius. So what this gardener did was um, she built a little box to hold it to support the vinyl package. And then they put in some little steel, um, some little steel. Oh, I don't know what those are called. Um, pieces of steel. Let's call it pieces of steel. So those are screwed in the sides to hold it up. She can zip it closed. You can see that over here. And what she did was she used some little seed uh, containers and you can use um, any other little kind of seed container that you want. You would want to cut slits in the bottom for drainage and you would wanna cut slits in the top for ventilation. It's very important to be able to ventilate your containers. If your containers don't ventilate, then your plants, your, your soil will dry out and then your plants will, will dry out and they'll cook. Because it, it can get very warm inside your containers in the winter time. It's uh, very surprising to me every time it does. Again, Ziploc bags can you be work, can be used. I believe that these Ziploc bags are probably inside out and that's why they're standing open something to think about. Uh, the photo on the right is my containers last year. This was all of my containers on my patio last year. My patio is on the southwest, uh, southeast corner of my house. It's a microclimate in there, and it is absolutely a beautiful protected place for me to start my seeds. It, it really does nicely. Okay, let's talk about potting soil. Potting soil is another thing that is um, very mysterious to a lot of gardeners, especially when it's their first year of uh, winter sowing. And here are just some guidelines. These are the things that I think about potting soil. And again, remember, if you can't find potting soil locally over the winter time, check into horticultural supply companies. So why are you gonna use potting soil, potting mix, as, a, as opposed to getting a shovel full of garden out of your ground, out of your garden? or your raised beds, or your um, flower pots from this year. Potting soil is made to drain well, or potting mix, I should say. It should say potting mix instead of soil. But potting mix is, is built to drain well. And, and this is one of the things that's very important with winter sowing is good drainage over the winter time. Your seeds don't wanna be waterlogged over the winter. Your seedlings don't wanna be waterlogged. Any type of potting soil will do. You do not have to worry about the brand unless you have had experience with a brand and it's been disastrous in the past. Um, do not use that for winter sowing. If, you're, if you've had a favorite or you know, you're down to the wire and you don't know what to use, you know, just ask the people at the garden center where you're buying it, you know, what's a good one that drains well. Or if you are forced to buy a potting soil and you open the bag and you say, wow, this is not this doesn't look like it's gonna drain well. You can buy an additional small bag of perlite and you can add perlite to your soil to help with drainage. I do that very often. So any type of potting soil is going to work or potting mix, but this is what I avoid. I avoid any kind of black potting soil um, that is soil-based or black soil-based. Um, there's a few brands out there that we can get here in the Midwest that are black soil-based. And black soil, when you put it into a, any kind of container, whether it be a raised bed, a big planter, or a small container like a, a winter sewing jug, it is going to compress, it's gonna become hydrophobic, or it's gonna be waterlogged. It's gonna be one of those three things. Seed starting mix is not appropriate for this application for a couple of reasons. Number one, it dries out really fast. I'm gonna keep going. Okay, 
So the only other thing that I think that you really need to avoid when you're choosing a, a potting soil is the, is the water holding polymers. If you live in the Midwest or the East Coast, Southeast, um, anywhere where you get regular precipitation during the winter time, added water holding polymers, you know, the water crystals, those are not appropriate for this application because your soil will be waterlogged over the winter and your soil won't drain well. You don't need it. Now, if you live in, say, uh, Southern California and you're going to kind of try this, or if you live in New Mexico and you're trying this, then New Mexico is cold enough to try this method and the water holding polymers uh, might help you there or in Arizona. Okay. So one important thing to remember about winter sowing is that not all of your seeds are going to germinate by May when you go to open your jugs. It's important to remember this because I don't want you to think that, you know, you go to open 50 jugs and 10 of them are not germinated yet. Plants are going to germinate in their own time and sometimes they just need the heat to germinate and they're not gonna get that heat until late May. So even though you open up the jugs in mid-May to the end of May, if they haven't germinated yet, don't throw them away. Just start watering them You know, every couple of days, just like a regular flower pot or a regular tray of seeds that is outdoors. Don't let them completely dry out. Don't swamp them, but just be patient because they probably will germinate. The only time that I've ever there's been a couple times where I haven't had things germinate, but there was one year where I had two, uh, two jugs of Queen of the Prairie, which is one of my favorite native plants, and one jug germinated beautifully and the other jug didn't. And by the time the end of the winter came and I opened up the jugs and I let that jug sit over the summer and it still didn't germinate, I finally realized that I never put seeds in the one jug of Queen of the Prairie. So be mindful of that too. <laughs> But uh, there are things like columbines and common milkweed that can take up to months to germinate. And there are plants out there that take a really long time. They take two winters to germinate and those are called double dormant plants. So when you are choosing your seeds or you have seeds that you have collected yourself, it may behoove you to look up a list of double dormant native seeds. There aren't very many of them that need double dormancy, but there's a few. And if you know that ahead of time, then you will be able to plan and you'll know you can put DD or you can write double dormant on the tag or on the outside of the container so you know what to expect. Uh, let's see. So what don't you winter sow? You don't winter sow anything that is fleshy. Tulips uh, need to be below the frost line. Same thing with daffodils. Dahlias are tropical. They need to be lifted. Iris are a big fleshy rhizome. We don't put those in a, a jug because they'll just rot. Raspberry canes, that question came up on Facebook. I couldn't believe it. It was uh, incredible that, that someone put that in there. But raspberry canes, you're not going to want to do that into a winter sowing jug. It's just, it's not the appropriate environment. Acorns, I think there are better ways to sow our native um, nut trees like acorns and bladder nut and hickory nut and things like that. It's gonna be a, there's gonna be better ways where they get um, more dry conditions than, than what's inside of a jug. I just think, I have a feeling that would be too wet. I should try and gather some acorns and do an experiment at my house next year when we, I get some acorns. Now we're gonna go over to the steps. Okay, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is clean your containers. If your container has had milk or um, juice or anything like that in it, um, you'll wanna wash it and just put a little bit of bleach in it. Wash with hot soapy water. Make sure that you get all that milk out. If you have any other kind of thing in those jugs, if it's a water jug, you don't have to wash it. But if it was a windshield wiper jug or a vinegar jug, just wash with hot soapy water and it'll be okay. And the windshield wiper jugs I've been using for many, many years. And as long as you clean them, they'll be fine. There's no residue. So wash your jugs and um, allow them to dry for about a day. And if you can allow them to dry for a day upside down, that's even better. When you go to wash your jugs, you're gonna take the caps off if the caps are there, throw the caps away, recycle the caps, do whatever you wanna do with the caps. You're never gonna use the cap ever again for this application no caps. Okay, and then you're going to do your drainage holes. You, you need to make your drainage holes before you cut your jug open to 
put the soil in um, so that you have the rigidity of the whole jug to supporting the bottom so that it doesn't slip and you don't get cut. I made the holes on this jug with, uh, with this paring knife. I just stuck it in. This is such nice lightweight plastic that I just stuck the paring knife in and I twirled it a few times and it made a circle. You can also use the paring knife and you stick in and you just make a V-shaped cut. You end up with this little tab and that tab can be pushed inside the container and then the bottom is flat. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. This is another way that you can make your holes in your containers and uh, protect your hands. This is just putting them in a milk crate and you just make your V cuts while it's upside down. And, um, or you can use a nail, you can use a hot ice pick, you can use um, a drill, you can, gosh, you can use almost anything. So it's really easy to cut through this again. It's really easy. So you don't, you don't have to, you don't really have to worry about it that much. It's not that hard. So here's where the rubber band is gonna come in. If you've never done this before, I would suggest that you do try and get a large rubber band and you put the large rubber band around the container and it's gonna be just below the handle. You make a line with a marker, that's your four inches. Remember I said you needed four inches of soil for really good root development. So this is four inches tall below the handle. And then you can take your rubber band off and then you can put your paring knife in, make a hole, and then you can cut the rest of the way with scissors. Again, super easy because the plastic is nice and thin, nice and lightweight. It's lightweight, but it's really strong too. So it's a conundrum, right? It's a mystery. Uh, one thing that you do wanna do is never cut the top completely off, leave a hinge, because once you tape this thing up, the handle is gonna help you maneuver these things, carry them outside, you know, moving them around if you have to move them around during the winter, because sometimes you just do. Um, Another way that you can cut your containers is by making the window method. This window can just be cut above your four inch line. You can cut it so the flap comes down or the flap goes up, it doesn't matter. The one good thing about this method is that it saves on tape. You will not use as much tape when you go to close them. Some tips for success, place a coffee filter. Remember the coffee filters were on the supply table. Place a coffee filter in the bottom of the containers. This is pretty good method. If you're going to put your containers outside on bare soil, it's gonna keep the slugs out because slugs will completely decimate what you have inside those containers if they can get in. For whatever reason, the natural coffee filter just works. And then by the time you go to plant your plants in May or the beginning of June, um, the coffee filter has disintegrated if you use the brown ones, the natural ones. But slugs can be really bad. So try and protect your plants from that. Also, if you're carrying your containers through the house, the coffee filter will keep the soil from falling out of the holes if it's kind of dry and crumbly. All right, the next thing you're gonna do after putting your coffee filter in um, is make sure that you have watered your soil thoroughly. I usually bring in little containers of soil a little bit at a time in a little trug, and then um, do this on my kitchen table, or I do it at my dining room table, or you know anywhere that I have space, basically. And then um, you're going to fill your container with soil. You're going to fill it up with four inches of soil. Now, here's a, a tip that I think is really important to know. Two things: your container can hold um, seven to eight cups of soil. We, my friend and I measured it out one year. And so you can pre-measure your soil if you want to. You don't have to, but just so you know. And then there's four cups to a quart. So you need eight cups of soil. You have four cups to a quart. So you need about two quarts per container. If you buy potting soil, that is a 38 dry quart measuring bag of potting soil, you'll be able to fill about nine bags. Nine, um, one gallon containers. So that's good to know. It's good to know that calculation. So um, 38 quart bag of potting soil, it's gonna say dry quarts on it. You can fill about nine jugs with that. When I fill my jugs with soil, 
Um, I get that like seven cups or eight cups in there. And then I'll take like my scissors or my fingers, chapstick, um, my marker, and I will kind of do this with the soil to get the air out of the soil. I don't want you to tamp down the soil so it is solid, so it's hard. I just want you to work out the air, kind of fluff that thing up a little bit, and then add more soil to it. One of the problems with winter sowing when you water for the first time, if your soil is too dry, you might have four inches of soil in there when you sow your seeds. But if the soil is too dry, the first time you water, your soil can shrink down to two inches. So just be aware of that you wanna get the air out, but you still want the soil to be fluffy. So don't tamp it down, but just try and put your fingers in there or a tool to stir it a little bit, let it settle down a little bit. You can put your hands on it to settle it down a little bit and then add a little bit more soil, but then fluff it up again. I hope that's clear. If that's not clear, I'll explain it again at the end. Just let me know that you need me to explain it again. So once you get your soil in, you can add your seeds. But how many seeds is too many seeds? These are hollyhock seeds and this is too many seeds. So if you have a plant that is going to have a very large leaf on the seedling once it gets its true leaves, then um, it's gonna be really hard to have this many seeds in here. The only reason I sowed this container of hollyhocks with this many seeds was because this was at the greenhouse. I knew that as soon as this germinated, I was gonna be able to bring these um, to the greenhouse and split it up and pot them up and keep growing them out in the greenhouse where I needed them at work. So this is the only reason I would put this many seeds into a jug. This is more like it. If you have something that's gonna be very large, here on the left, we have sunflower seeds. And this sunflower seed, no joke, this sunflower seed was like an inch long. I don't know what variety they were, Someone gave them to me, but they were really beautiful, gigantic seeds, and they had a, a really beautiful flower. Um, I like to grow sunflowers for the bumblebees. They enjoy them. Um, other native bees enjoy them too. But I spaced them out, and you see how I planted those sunflower seeds on their side, just like you would a cantaloupe or a zucchini seed or a pumpkin seed. That's to keep them from rotting. Anything that is going to be that large, you definitely want to turn on side. The other seeds here, this is an annual called Starflower. Um, I just wanted, because it's an easy seed to see on the soil surface, I just wanted to show you um, how spacing your seeds out is really a good thing. And it's, it's not that hard if your seeds are big enough to see. Now, if you have a seed of something like uh, Verbena Hestata, oh my gosh, whatever you do, don't just blanket the soil with Verbena Hestata. And I'll show you why at the end I have a picture of my verbena disaster. Uh, if you have very, very tiny seeds, sprinkle them very lightly and uh, you will cover, all of your seeds will be covered in, in the jugs, um, except for seeds that are the size of dust, like your verbena and your lobelia, those are gonna be too small. You don't, well, they're not too small, but they're so small that they don't require covering, they need light to germinate. These are zinnia seeds in here. This is one of those cat containers, the cat litter containers. Um, I don't suggest you ever split a container and put two different kinds of plants in it unless they are the same species and unless you have them in a giant container like this cat litter container. So I have one color of zinnias on one side and one color on the other side. This worked out well for these guys. But if you put sulfium in with cardinal flower, it could be really messy. If you have plants that you're going to be growing that are plants that will not transplant well later on because the root system doesn't like to be disturbed, growing them in um, toilet paper and uh, paper towel tubes are is a really great thing. And I, this is kind of intimate, we're being intimate here, people. Um, I buy my toilet paper and paper towel from Who Gives a Crap? <laughs> it's a great company. Um, and their the rolls that they have, the core rolls are really a little bit more heavy duty than the regular ones in the grocery store. And so they're ideal for this application. In one of the round um, vinegar jugs that I have, I can put, what is that, nine, 10? I can put 10 rolls in there. 
I put soil underneath them. I stand the rolls up. I put a little bit of soil in between them. You can see that in the photo over here on the right. The soil in between them um, keeps things supported, keeps those rolls standing up. These did not disintegrate at all over the winter. I was really, really impressed that I could um, take these things out and my plants were intact and the tubes were intact and so I could just plant them. Okay, so once you get your seeds sown, then you wanna close your container up. But what do you do before you close your container up? You make sure there is a tag inside the container. It is a must because when you do open your containers, if you put the name up here on the top of the jug and you open up your container by mid-May or so, or the end of May, if there's if you haven't transplanted yet, you might cut the top off of your jug. Like I, I do this because I'm, I'm usually not planting things until the end of May, the first couple of weeks of June for my plant sale at the end of June. So I will cut all the tops off and recycle them but then what are the plants inside? So again, I cannot stress to you more, put a tag on the inside. I know I'm harping, I'm being a, I'm being a big old naggy mother here. So uh, tape your jug closed. You can use, um, again, you can use the poly tape, which is a clear tape. It's really sticky, it's waterproof and it's UV proof. It's really a nice tape. So this is from Ace, it's called poly tape, it's good stuff. I hope they still make it. I haven't checked it out lately. Um, and duct tape works really well. I've even seen a couple of people on the Facebook page that have used masking tape. So if that's the only tape that you have, do a little bit of an experiment. You can always retape them later. But uh, the outside plastic has to be really, it has to be perfectly dry and room temperature in order for you to tape. So if you're going to retape, you're going to have to bring your jug inside. All right, close your jug, label your jug. Uh, this is how I label my jug up here on the top. This is how I label all of my jugs. And I use this marker. And I usually write the name of the plant and then I write the name over the top again. Uh, sometimes I'll use a piece of duct tape. And if I use the duct tape, if you use the duct tape for a tag like this, I would say put it down here on the bottom of the jug. So when you cut everything open, you still have the name of the plant. Okay. And labeling. So you can use things for labeling on the inside of your jugs, plastic plant markers, if you want to buy them. They're super cheap on Amazon, super cheap. Plastic knives, even cheaper. You can use a spoon. I had a party one time, had a ton of spoons left over. One winter, that's all I used for the inside. And it worked out great. You write the name of the plant in the bowl on the spoon. Duct tape on the bottom of the container. And then you can use a Sharpie because it won't be exposed to light. So you just make a square of duct tape. Um, you put it on the bottom of your container. You wanna write the name of the plant before you cut your duct tape off the roll and stick it to the bottom of your container. Just try not to cover up any of your drainage holes when you do that. And then you can use a UV resistant marker like these. Or a China a paint marker works well. Um, a China pencil, which is also called a grease marker, a grease pencil. Those work really well. Labeling seems to be a struggle for a lot of people, but this is the reason why labeling is so important. This was my, um, these are my containers from two years ago, three years ago, three years ago. And um, you can see some of them haven't germinated. So even if I did know what the seedlings look like, some of them didn't germinate yet. So um, identifying them is very important. So it, soon after this, Within a few weeks, all of these tops are gone. You're left with the bottoms and you gotta have a tag. As soon as you tape your, ta your, your containers up, whatever containers you use, put your seeds in, you label them, you tag them, you put them outside immediately. Do not keep them in the house. Do not keep them in the garage. Do not make your jugs right now. Keep them in the garage or in the house, anticipating you know, with the seeds in them, and keeping them in the in the house, the basement, the garage, anticipating to put them out after this winter solstice because they may germinate even in an attached garage where it's not always warm, but it might be warm enough for certain things to germinate. If your plants germinate before winter solstice and you go to put your jug outside, your seedlings will die. 
they'll die in the January cold. So this is why that December solstice time is important so that people are not doing this in October and then um, things will germinate and then and then you're kind of stuck. You're, you're kind of stuck. There's nothing that you can really do for those seedlings unless you have a greenhouse or you have some way to protect it over the winter, like really protect it. Um, so place your jugs out immediately. Do not wait more than 24 hours. If I make a whole bunch of jugs at night, I put them out in the morning before I go to work or I put them out that night. They got to get into the cold as fast as possible. These are meant to be snowed on. This is perfectly fine. This was a few weeks. Uh, this is a few weeks later. This is in spring. Things are starting to sprout. So this was probably February, maybe early March. Um, but yeah, them getting snowed on is great because then they get some, some water inside. They don't get a whole lot. And that was my problem the first year. Um, okay. You can place your containers in some kind of crate so that if you do have to move them around the patio um, or the yard or from one place to another, um, if you put your containers, one thing I always forget to talk about is where to put the containers. When you first put your containers out in January, February, March, it doesn't matter where they go. They don't have to be in full sun at that point. When the containers start to germinate, which is usually around the third week of March, the, the most hardy things are gonna germinate around then, then you will put them uh, in the sun, you'll move them. So having them in crates is really useful. Like I said before, watering containers is really important. Um, you are going to need to do this if you go out and you're checking your containers and you pick up your container and you're anticipating it to be heavy, but then you then it flies up in your arm because it's so light, it's dry, it needs water. So make sure you water it. Um, you can water it in multiple different ways. I find the most easy way to water is just to have big old cookie sheets or, or full-size jelly roll sheets, if you can find those, maybe at a resale store or something. The jelly roll sheets are great because it holds like, I think six or eight, six or seven uh, jugs, and you just fill it up with some water and just let them sit there for about a half an hour or an hour, let them soak up the water, and they're watered. Um, but I will also use let's see if i have a picture i'm watching the time we're running out of time so um we have here a one liter water bottle that i have heated up a pin this is what the pins and the um candle was for on the supply table i just heat up a big upholstery pin that has a very very sharp tip you can use an ice pick which has a good sharp tip you heat it up and you just poke about two dozen holes in the middle of this thing and you have a rain shower coming out of it. This matches up to the top of the, the opening of the milk jug. So the water goes directly into the milk jug. And if you rotate it around, rotate your wrist as you are squeezing the bottle, then the water is gonna hit all sides of the jug and it will run down the side and it will water the jug. What you are looking for is condensation, okay? You have to watch out for this. You'll see condensation uh, during the whole winter. As soon as your jugs look like they're starting to dry up, like this one back here, condensation cycle is stopping. That means that your plants have used all of the water in that container and it's time to water. So this one, not ready to water. This one back here, definitely ready to water. You just got to keep an eye on them. That's why I put them, initially, that's why I put them all on the deck so that I can watch them. I, I never get all of them on the deck, though. There's always too many. So after you put your jugs out, you're monitoring their watering. What are you going to expect in the next few weeks? You are going to expect germination to happen. Again, it should start somewhere around the third week of March for the cold hardiest plants. And usually the first thing to, to germinate for me is going to be my common milkweed and the swamp milkweed. Um, they seem to be the hardiest. And um, let's see, so the seeds are gonna start germinating as winter is transitioning into spring. And that means longer days and warmer nights, uh, warmer temperatures overnight. And that's, that's what triggers them. So 
one one more thing about watering though what i want you to think about with the watering and why the jugs need to be moist over the whole winter is i want you to imagine what native plants are experiencing out in wetlands out in the forest out in the prairies um, out in the meadows out in the savannas wherever we have natural areas i want you to picture and and think about what those seeds are experiencing for the winter they're experiencing cold temperatures all winter, and they are experiencing moisture all winter, whether it be rain or whether it be snow. And it may come and go, and there may be a few times where it's going to be a little bit dry. For the most part, though, native seeds are going to stay moist all winter long. And this is how they get their cold, moist stratification, by being out in a field or in a forest or a wetland where it is wet and cold all winter long. Now, um, if we were to cold moist stratify in the house, we would do it in the fridge and um, it would take, you know, three to six weeks up to a year. It depends on the plant, but most of the time I got away with three weeks when I was doing this at work. Um, so even though the plants are going to experience the whole winter with cold and moist conditions, uh, when we do it artificially, you know, three to six weeks. So this is our star flower, those big white fluffy uh, seeds that looked like uh, shuttlecocks. <laughs> I love those seeds because they look really interesting. So I spaced them out really beautifully in the container when I first sowed them. This is what they looked like later. They're very easy to split up this way uh, to replant and do whatever I need to do with them, whether it put them straight into a ground or a container or uh, pot them up for sale. So when the days are cool, but uh, warm-ish, you can start opening the containers and then closing them up at night. If it's still freezing overnight, they have to be closed at night, but during the day they can be open. And again, mid-April, late April is when I start opening. And then mid-May is usually when I open all the jugs and um, I'm recycling the tops and spending the whole afternoon out here and uh, just keeping busy with this with my supervisor, Ginger George, supervises everything I do outside and meows at me a lot. I don't know what he's saying, but he meows a lot. So um, looking at this photograph, I want you to think about when I said that I don't advise you to put more than uh, you know, two different types of seeds into a container. This is why, because some seedlings are very big. Some are very leafy and some are very small and short. And those that are small and short, if you pair them up with the wrong thing, the small seedlings are going to get shaded out by the big seedlings. Even if you turned that container around every day and rotated it, it's just simply, it's not a good idea. Um, I'm not gonna tell you not to do it, but I would advise against it. Now, um, Worrying about your containers being waterlogged over the winter is one thing when we're talking about soil, when we're talking about snow, but once spring comes, you need to make sure that your, your containers are not going to get waterlogged. These four containers that are down here in the water on my deck, they drowned. They never sprouted um, because they were in the water, and I, I just kind of had a feeling that was going to happen, so I wanted to see if it really would, but all of these other ones up here that did not sprout when I opened them after this rain and after the soil dried out, these kind of did all sprout. This was such a heavy rainstorm. It was like a three or four hour rain event. And it was just the heaviest downpour. You can see it over here. The heaviest downpour that I'd seen in a long time. Unfortunately, my deck boards are butted up next to each other so tight that they held water. And this is the first time they ever held water um, in the whole time that I've had this deck, which was like 15 years. So I had to dash out in the rain and flip over all of my um, waterproof trays. These are all trays that don't have holes in them and um, had to put the plants all up on them. So make sure they're not getting waterlogged in the spring. Uh, Verbena histata, this is what overseeding looks like if you have something that's very, very tiny. My volunteers in my greenhouse hated it when I sowed seeds, hated it because this is what I would do all the time. This is what I did every time. I overseeded everything. Even if it was a little tiny two by two cell, I overseeded everything. They were much better at it than me. 
<laughs> um, but they would always say, oh my gosh, you're making more work for us because we have to transplant all those little babies and we have to thin them out and split them. And so you, you want to avoid that. So don't do this. The, the reality is, is that from here all the way over to here, I couldn't use any of those seedlings because they were so small. The roots never really developed. I had beautiful plants from this section back here, but it was um, wasted. They could have been even better plants had they been spaced out properly. So lesson learned. Okay, word about fertilizer. I think I kind of covered it. Um, you don't really need to fertilize until after your plants are transplanted, whether it's in the ground or in a pot. Slow release pellets are great. Organic fertilizer that is uh, liquid is really good. If you are going to use any kind of liquid fertilizer, make sure you mix it below what the directions say. If it says two tablespoons per two gallons of water, put in one tablespoon. Always fertilize less than what it says because you don't wanna burn your plants and your plants don't need as much fertilizer as you think. You want to consistently feed very slowly. And this is mostly for plants that are gonna go in big planters that are in sterile potting soil in big planters like annuals. This, so this is not how we would treat our native plants. Once we put our native plants in the ground, they really should be okay. Now, when I am potting up my annual plants for my plant sale, I do feed them a little bit, a very, very weak solution a fertilizer because they're in a pot, they're in sterile potting soil, and I want them to be very presentable um, for my plant sale. So I do fertilize them a little bit, but once natives go in the ground, they really don't need it. Transplanting seedlings, if you cut your containers open like this, you can slide that um, soil uh, out and you can just break them up into little plugs. You can break the plants up individually in this case, or you can cut them apart. These are common milkweed seedlings that were actually sprouted in this pot over the winter last year. And when I pulled them out of the pot, it was, I think it was just a pod that I threw on top of the pot to see what would happen. I just like inverted it, see what would happen. And they blew, they grew really beautifully, but there was also like cup plant <laughs> mixed in there. So I had to separate all of them. But look at those beautiful roots. Those are the same kind of roots that you get in a winter sowing container. Um, these are my sunflowers that I put into the paper towel tubes. These equally have really beautiful roots. You can see down along the bottom. They were very dense roots. I was able to pull these apart and I cut down the sides of the, um, the tubes and then I put them in the ground. So you can do this for Baptisia and any other kind of native that is really kind of, um, that doesn't like to be have disturbed roots. So I know Baptisia is one of them and sunflower is definitely another one of them if you're gonna grow sunflowers. Now, if you end up with uh, seedlings that are extremely dense, I think these are probably salvia seedlings. Uh, when seedlings are extremely dense, you may be forced to thin them depending on how many you need, um, or you can just simply, uh, this was the group of seedlings that came out of the jug, and then you can just break them up into like maybe about one and a half to two inch plugs, pot them up, put them in the ground, whatever you want to do, uh, or you can thin them out a little bit and let the plants get a little bit bigger. It's, it's however you want to do it. But that is called the Hunko seedlings method. That's what Trudy Davidoff, the lady who started this method, calls it. And she really doesn't believe in thinning anything. And I've only thinned things a couple of times when I really made the mistake of overseeding. Um, it's not a habit that you should get into because you, you shouldn't need to do it because you should probably seed a little bit lighter just so you get good root development. And that's mostly the reason why. If your seedlings come out pretty dense like this, I'm pretty sure this is oregano. Um, this is what I was talking about with perennial herbs. The, if you sow a whole seed package into one container, you're gonna have 150 or 200 plants, but you don't need that many in your garden. You probably need less than what's on the left here on this little hunk for your garden because it's a perennial and they do grow pretty big. So if you get this nice dense little pad of plants like this, you can put them on something hard, cut them up just like brownies, 
and cut them again to make a plug. You can probably get nine plugs of this plant out of this and pot them up or plant them in the ground. So this is called the brownie method. And this one back here, this is called the taffy method where you just take the seedlings out and you pull them apart and plant them. Always about food, isn't it? Making me hungry. Okay. Um, you can plant your seedlings up into pots. This is from my pot, my plant sale. These were seedlings that I probably planted up a day or two before this uh, picture was taken. Um, and like I said, this is the only time that I fertilize my natives is when they're in these little pots. And um, there's a tiny bit of slow release in here, like a really tiny bit. I overdid it last year and um, I paid for it. And, um, or rather I didn't get paid for it because the plants died because I put too much in. So very, very little fertilizer in these, but uh, this is probably the day after I potted these up. There's always two to three seedlings in a pot when I plant my pots for my plant sale. I'm very generous um, with my clients, with my plants, because I always have enough seedlings to be generous like this. And then um, I fertilized, and this is why they're so perky the day after I planted them. Spring sowing. So if you have something that you have forgotten that is um, some kind of tender annual um, or an herb or a vegetable and it's like the end of May and you're like, oh my gosh, I really need this plant. Or you wanna plant some natives for fall planting out in the garden or for a fall plant sale, you can spring sow. And the only difference with spring and summer sowing is this. You put about five new vents around the top of your containers. And that way it's gonna vent all the extra hot air that you're gonna have in summertime and springtime. And there's a couple of reasons why this is a good method for springtime and summertime sowing, because number one, squirrels. Squirrels are a menace. And if you have squirrels that dig up anything that you plant outside, this is a great way to sow seeds outside in spring and early summer. Um, and keep them out of it while your plants are germinating. And then the other thing is, is that uh, some seeds are going to benefit from a little bit of extra heat, but you have to be able to vent what it doesn't need. Now, what happens if you have winter sown, but you don't plant? I had a, sh a shoulder injury a couple of years ago, and I ended up with probably four times as many containers as this um, that ended up wintering for a second winter. So these were not double dormant plants. These were containers full of plants. They went through a second winter, open like this, exposed. And the only time I would ever do this is with native plants. So here we have Echinacea pallida. Uh, we have a digitalis. Uh, this is digitalis lutea, which is a perennial digitalis. Oh, I forget what this is. This could be a different kind of digitalis, columbines. Rubina's back here. Um, this is prairie, purple prairie culver, and then this is probably cup plants. So all of these overwintered on my patio, just like this on top of my planters, just kind of hither and thither. And uh, so they were really beautiful, huge, strong seedlings when I went to go put them in the ground because these were destined for my garden, but I had to get my shoulder fixed first. You know how it goes. So um, if it's an extremely hardy perennial, it can overwinter outside in a jug without cover for a second year in a protected area. And again, my patio is kind of protected on all four sides. It's a little bit warmer than the rest of my property, which is very small city size property. And um, so I can do that. And if you have a nice protected little area where you can put your plants over the winter, where they're going to get a little bit of water, a little bit of sun, then um, if you forget to plant something, run out of time, um, don't fuss about it too much. Um, just keep it over the winter and see if it works. So I have a few pictures of some things that I have winter sown in the past couple of years. Um, again, I really like zinnias and I like Spanish flag, um, for my hummingbirds and the, and the monarchs just love zinnias. I love basil. So this is Emerald Towers basil. If you're into herbs, this is a great basil. It doesn't bloom until late, late August. And so you can get two to three cuttings of basil off of these plants. This is two and a half feet tall. So these are a little bit extra big. 
Um, this is a, a little annual pollinator plant called uh, Painted Tongue. Whenever I find an annual flower or an herb that's named Dolly, I have to plant it. So don't grow Dolly basil. It's no good. Um, New England asters, I have been growing for many years with winter sowing, showy goldenrod. This is my showy goldenrod that I think is six years old in my garden. And um, as you can see, if you are uh, goldenrod averse, uh, this goldenrod has hardly traveled. I planted five of them in here and they're still here. They don't travel around. This is a great variety. This is Liatris scariosa uh, variety newlandii. And uh, this is just a close up shot of the flowers before they bloomed this year. Some other things that um, are not native that I grow I grow globe thistle for the bumblebees, and uh, the seeds are for the birds. Purple coneflower, perennial lupin, um, they grow very well. That lupin is great because it's a perennial. Golden ragwort, which is a native, grows very well for me. Delphinium exaltatum, I've grown for many years, it's a native. Gloriosa daisy is a little bit of a derivative of a native. Um, butterfly weed, again, showy goldenrod, it's a little close up. Yellow cornflower, it's not a native, but this is a really good bee plant. And it's kind of a interesting plant in my garden. So my garden is about 80% native and um, you know, 70, 80% native. It's getting more and more every year. I'm taking out things that are inappropriate. Um, so I do definitely see the value of having more natives than not. I know better because I've been educated on it for a long time. And so we have a couple things in here. I let my common milkweed run rampant. Um, I do have uh, common Monarda and not common Monarda. This is Rudbeckia herbsona. This is a variety of um, Golden Glow, which is Lacinata, Rudbeckia Lacinata, which I do have out in the back of my property. Spice bush there. Um, I had really beautiful swamp milkweed. I have to replant this year because you got to replant swamp milkweed every few years. Little Rudbeckia, I think it's a Fulgata. So that's just one part of my garden. And just to show you that you can winter sow just about anything, birdhouse gourds and loofahs, if you um, are interested in those, they do winter sow very well. So some more places to find information, winter sowers on Facebook. Again, I'm a member there. Uh, I encourage you to become a member. There's a lot of information on there that is uh, pinned to the top of the page at the front page. So you can explore that. That is the substitute for the wintersowers.org website. Uh, the seed site and tomclothier.hort.net are both sites that are really very good if you're looking for information about a specific seed. I don't know how much native plant seed uh, information they would have, but it, there's a lot of ornamentals on there. And then if you are looking for information for native seeds, I'm sure you're all familiar with Prairie Moon. They really have the best information and they always have a picture of the seed when you're going out and collecting seed. That's a good reference place to go to make sure you have the right part of the plant to be the seed. I wanted to show you something that um, my husband made me this year. This is a seed pod crusher. This is about six or seven inches long, about five inches wide. This is a handle from something that he found. But I find that um, Penstemon digitalis and a few other seed pods are just really, really hard to open. I mean, I have bloodied my thumbs under my fingernails many times trying to open these. So I bought some pillowcases um, and I and my husband made me this and I opened up those Penstemon seed pods in about five minutes. So just wanted to share that with you guys because I know y'all gather your own seed. So let's review really quickly and then get on to questions. Um, the first thing is, Winter sowing is really easy. Don't overthink it. Uh, don't go out and spend lots of money on special equipment and use materials around the house that you already have. So it's, it's, it, it's economical. It's completely the opposite of traditional seed sowing indoors. Uh, try a few different methods to experiment. You know what? If you have 10 different kinds of seeds you're gonna grow, grow five of them in a milk jug, do a couple in food containers, do a couple in uh, two gallon bags, just give it a try. But definitely don't overthink it. Trust the process. Trust that these seeds are going to live over the winter outdoors. Even tomato seeds that are sown way back in January are going to produce a tomato plant for you to plant by Mother's Day. It's a beautiful process. It's absolutely genius. 
in its simplicity and it is incredible in its flexibility. I think that's a very important thing to remind you is that it's very flexible. I have, um, so what I showed you here tonight is my method, but there's a lot of other methods that people will show you how to do or that will pop up on the Facebook page and those are okay too. So don't get stuck in one way to do it like sowing seeds indoors. There really is um, one best way to do it with the seed trays and the shelves and all that and the lights. So don't feel like this is rigid at all. It's extremely flexible. And if you find a good way to do it, that's going to work for you, a certain container, a certain type of potting soil, um, a certain place in your yard that might be unconventional. You might not think that other people would put their containers in this part of their yard like, you know, you would stick with what works for you. Once you find what works for you, stick with it. Okay. And then go out there and teach someone how to do this. Because um, when Bill and I were talking the first time uh, we introduced ourselves, we had a phone call and we were talking and, and Bill stressed to me that he just feels it's really, really important for people to get native plants in their yards. Even if it's just one type of native plant, even if it's two types of native plants, it's hard to find native plants unless you go to specific nurseries. It's starting to get a little easier, but it's still a little tough. So I think that if we go out there, we teach other people about winter sowing, we will open up and expand how many people are able to grow native plants and get them into the gardens in Indiana and the surrounding states. So there's my soapbox. All right, do you guys have any questions? That was terrific, Dolly, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for... Uh... For a very informative uh, presentation, and I love that you love collecting seeds, and I and love, I, it. I, I, I love the uh, emphasis there at the end as well. Uh, we are over time, uh, but we will take some questions. See if if you would well, would you please uh, cover those questions? Sure, uh, and I think everyone was so glued to uh, Dolly's presentation <laughs> that uh, there weren't a lot of questions uh, throughout. Uh, which is always a good thing. Maybe it's also, Dolly, that you did such a wonderful job in covering it, uh, answering those questions. Uh, when you were talking about the coffee filters at the bottom of your um, your containers, I know you did mention you know, the brown ones. Someone did ask, um, are the white coffee filters okay to use as well? Um, I don't see why not. You know, that paper is bleached but I don't think it's something that would leach into your soil and kill your plants. Um, but I do like the idea that the, the brown ones are not bleached at all. There's no treatment to them. Um, so that's why I do like them better. Okay. Um, there was a, a question, but I don't have any uh, context to what it's in reference to. And I didn't write down the name, but it was, uh, it just mentioned four inches in length question marks. So I, that was after the, area about filters so uh what i'm gonna do is go maybe back that was plant tags maybe oh clayton i don't know if he's still on and um we could unmute him or he could uh, re-add to his uh what he was referring to <clears throat> um oh, oh it was about the toilet paper tubes oh oh um, okay okay the toilet paper tubes yes they're about four inches long and um, I get about two out of the paper towel rolls. So I just, I cut them in half. Okay, so that, that yeah. sounds about right. That makes sense now. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, was there another one after that? Let me scroll back up here. Do, 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 do. I've got one here. I'll go okay. ahead and ask it. Go ahead. Uh, when, when would you winter sow the loofah and birdhouse, birdhouse gourds? When I did it two years ago, I think I sowed them probably in um, February. But okay. since they're such a tender plant, you could wait until later if you want to. My plan for next year is to winter sow them in February or March, like I usually do most of my stuff. And then I'm going to plant them out, but I'm going to put a cloche over them so that I can plant them earlier and they won't get hit by the frost. They need a really, really long season. So I'm gonna try and plant them like a month earlier than I did before, which was like mid June. So, okay. um, but yeah, just, I planted them just like any other time, but you know, they're a very, very large seed. 
So plant them on their side, you know, stand them up on the side. Let's see, uh, I've got another one right in front of me. Barb uh, was saying, I've heard that a rolling pin would work for the digitalis seed, seed pods. Yep. yep. Oh, I think so. Yep. I didn't think of that, but that's a great idea. Yeah. Fabulous presentation from Amy. Um, any others, Deb, that you see in the chat? Um, back to the coffee filters, someone was asking if uh, newspapers could also work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So it sounds like just really anything to kind of help keep the uh, slugs out. Yes, and, anything uh, the dirt be, in. And yeah, anything that can be a biodegradable barrier. Yeah. Um, a lot of people were making comments as far as what they have used or done in the past, which hopefully some others on the call will go through the chat, but uh, someone said that they use old blinds to use uh, their plant markers, which is a great idea. Yep, I've done that. That's a great way to recycle those. That's oh, absolutely. a great way. Okay. Um, and it looks like one last or another questions come through uh, as to the potting soil. Dolly, you had mentioned not to or uh, not to use old. So they're asking why not reuse potting soil. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that you will have um, algae spores in the old potting so soil or there will be fungal spores in the old potting soil and they will bloom inside your containers and kill whatever is inside your containers. And I can say that confidently because I have experienced it. So don't use, don't reuse soil. Uh, that's um, good to know. I think I have used uh, soil, but not for seeding, just when I'm putting it in uh, potted plants. Oh yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, but, I've done that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The seed packets will typically have uh, spacing recommendations. Is that acceptable to use those when you're going this method? Um, you can. If there's no reason not to, but you don't really need to because you're going to take these things apart and plant anyway. So you don't you don't have to, you know you can. Just dump them in there. <laughs> yeah, you can just dump them in there on a, a level layer, just one layer. That that's appropriate. You know, you did mention uh, you did mention that when they're really small, that you don't put any dirt on top. Did you? Yes. Uh, is there a criteria as far as the how big your seeds are? Is how much dirt you want to put on top of them? For most varieties, um, for most types of seeds that are just not like dust particle size or near there, um, I would not cover or I sprinkle very lightly. Everything else gets about a quarter inch of soil over the top. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another question. How would you do viburnum, the black haw? It's a double dormancy, warm than cold. So when it's you double would, the way you do double dormancy is that you'll make a jug. It'll go through the first winter. You will open it up for the summer, close it back up, tape it closed for the second winter, and hopefully it will be germinated by the second spring. Okay. A person has indicated that they are trying cardinal flower, columbine, and tall bellflower. What should I expect come spring if I've direct sown into planters? Um, they should probably germinate. Planters are probably a good way to do it instead of the ground because it's a little bit more of a controlled environment. Um, they, they should germinate. I think you should expect them to germinate. Uh, just be aware that, you know, you might have had some weed seeds blow into those containers if they're not covered. And um, you need to be able to discern the difference between the seedlings you want and the weeds that you don't want. Okay, uh, fabulous presentation. They have five pages of notes. I, I would concur, I have that many as well. Great, thanks, thanks. Looks like everyone is, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Uh, learned so much, Dolly, great information. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks for having me. Back to you, Bill. Um, All right.
I think Bill's going to probably email everybody who was signed up uh, the handouts. Mm -hmm. So you will get a handout. I will. I will. And my email address will be on the handout. So you can okay. email me if you have a question. Sounds great. Well, thank you again, Dolly. Very informative and appreciate uh, all of you all being here uh, today, tonight. And uh, I guess with that, we'll sign off. So happy growing. Bye-bye, y'all. Bye-bye, everybody. Good luck. Thanks.